Good morning. Good morning. So today I'm going to continue in our uh, four-part series of the journey. Uh, I will the journey. Um, here's a little recap. We're looking at uh, Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7. It goes like this. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egypt, uh, Egyptians. That was week one where Pastor Justin shared about knowing God. It, it was a uh, very powerful message because... What you got to understand is this journey cannot start unless you know God. That's the starting point of everything, is having the relationship of knowing who God is and what he's done. Okay? And then it goes on to say, I will free you from being slaves to them, talking about the Egyptians. Last week, Jeff, um, our small groups coordinator, gave us a really powerful message with his testimony about where he was and how he found freedom, because that's what the second step, that this is what he's talking about here. I will be finding freedom. Um, here's a crazy statistic for you that, that I, it just blows me around uh, away. That 87% of Christians never make it past this cup. 87% of Christians never find freedom. Or as Jeff said it yesterday, never get, you know, God originally took them out of Egypt, and then the next step is to get Egypt out of you. Right? They never get Egypt out of themselves. The way I say it is, God wants to get your yesterdays out of you today so you can move forward with his tomorrows. Right? 87% of Christians never make it past this step. Which is why we're so adamant about our freedom groups. Because we want to help you move forward and take the next step in the journey. Right? And, and the next step in the journey is what we're going to talk about today. And it says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. So this is the only statement in the journey that God tells you how he's going to do it. He's going to do it with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, okay? And then the last I will statement is, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And next week, Justin's going to close up this uh, series out um, where he's talking about making a difference and leaving a legacy. As you, as you heard, it's uh, his last Sunday as the lead pastor coming the next week. So it's going to be a very powerful, don't miss it, okay? But today, we're going to look specifically at this part of Exodus. Um, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. Specifically, we're going to call this Discover Purpose, right? That's what this is all about. This is you figuring out how God wired you. Okay. So the first place I always like to start when I'm doing a message is the definition. Okay. What is the definition of redeem or to be redeemed? Okay. First one is to buy back or to repurchase. So I'm going to give you guys a little wordplay here because I like to give you guys things to imagine and think about because I think that's the best way we can learn. Jesus did that with his parables. He got everybody on the same page. He gave them something they could understand, right? So, this is like walking through the flea market. You're at the flea market to repurchase something somebody's already purchased for a price. So here's the wordplay, right? This is like Jesus walking through a flea market. And there he is, he's walking through, and he stops in this little shop. And there you are, sitting on a shelf. And Jesus is like, ooh, that's a good one. That's a special one right there. How much does that one cost? The owner's like, well, that one's going to cost you everything. And then Jesus is like, okay. And then he goes to the cross. And he paid everything to repurchase you. To redeem you from the life that you were living Right? Okay, come on, guys. I am preaching better than you guys are reacting. But he repurchased you. Right? He bought you back from the power of sin. It's just great. God, so amazing. Right? I can stop right there. Let's go home, right? Come on. Um, just kidding. I'm going to keep going. Uh, the second one is to change for the better or to reform you. So a lot of us live this life where we live this life that says, God, help me not do bad. I just, I want to live a life that's not bad. But why don't we, we pray instead that, that he wants to change you for the better. 
He wants to reform you to something better. God, why don't you make me more gooder? I mean, come on, that's just for you English people that really frustrate you right there. More gooder, right? Okay? Uh, just, why don't I live a better life? God is calling us to a better life. He wants to reform us into something better. Right? He wants to redeem you. Okay? And the last one is, is simply to repair or to restore. Now again, I like to give you guys a little wordplay, so we're going to talk about, let's think about a classic car. And this is how you originally bought your classic car. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, right? 67 Shelby GT500, my dream car. If anybody's ever curious, that's it right there, okay? Um, if you see the movie uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, that's Eleanor. That's the one, okay? So people look at this, and, and, and they take this. God took this. This is you. This is how he found you. And he starts to get all the dents out of you. That's finding freedom. That's step two. He starts to fix the fenders, the suspension, the engine. That's step two, finding freedom. And eventually, he puts it all back together. And it looks like that. He restores it to its original purpose. Amen. He yes. restores it yes. to its original purpose. Yes. Right? That's what redeemed means. He wants to take something that's garbage and turn it into a masterpiece. Amen. Right? right? Yeah. So how does he do it? How does God take that and turn it into a masterpiece? Well, the first thing he does, he does it with an outstretched arm, is what Exodus, Exodus tells us, right? The psalmist says it this way in Psalms 1835. He says, he bends down to make me great. So let's ask ourselves, why does God need to bend down or outreach his arm? And the question is really simple. We live a life of inferiority. We have an inferiority complex. We don't see ourselves the way God sees us. Because God sees greatness in you because he designed you that way. Right? Right? We see our lives as not great, as insignificant, as low, and, and we have this mentality, right? But, but I tell you, that's a lie. God's greatness is in you because he put it in you. Amen. Right? Yeah. And God wants to help you discover that greatness or your purpose. And that's what that he has intended for you. So in high school, a little bit about myself, um, in high school... I was a solid B student, um, but I did not live up to the expectations of my brother or my sister. My sister graduated with a great four point something stupid GPA. There you go. My mom's here to correct me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, she graduated eighth in her class. Um, my brother graduated with, she went on to college with a four I scholarship at Florida Southern, graduated starting shortstop for the softball team. Amazing, right? My brother got an offer from the Navy to join their nuclear program, which I thought was really funny. He was wearing a sweater about it. I thought that was really funny. Um, and he turned it down to pursue his, his, what he had a passion about, owning a business. Okay? Me, I didn't know, so I joined the Army and then didn't tell anybody about it. Okay? That was, <laughs> I didn't know, right? But, but in high school, I ran cross country and track. I was about this tall, but I weighed about 160 pounds, so you could count every bone on my body. It was fantastic, okay? Um, and I ran the hurdles. I was a sprinter, sort of. Um, and I ran cross country, which was long distance, which I sort of did that well, well too, okay? But in track, my hurdle coach, he believed in me. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He saw greatness in me. 
And he pushed me. And even when I had fall, he picked me up. John, you got this. He saw greatness in me. He saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And that was before I ever got into high school. But I did a middle school summer camp track and field thing. He saw greatness in me. The same way God sees greatness in you. King David, you know, the guy that the Bible tells us was a man after all God's heart, that guy, he said this in Psalms 42. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and out of the mud, and he set my feet on solid ground. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's like that song we were just singing, the resurrected king has resurrected me. He's outstretched his arm to pull you out of the stuff that you're in. To redeem you, to buy you back, to restore you and to reform you to your original purpose. Because there's something in this world that only you can do. And that's what next step, uh, next steps are, our step two that we're doing today, that's what it's all about right there. It's us helping you identify your purpose that God has specifically designed you to do. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Second way he does it, second way he redeems it, is with mighty acts of judgment. Now, I know this sounds very contradictory to pulling us up and pushing us towards our purpose. But what you have to understand, what you need to realize about the mighty acts of judgment is what and whom God is judging. God's mighty acts of judgment are reserved for the one who prowls around like a roaring lion, Amen. seeking whom he may destroy. That's who his mighty acts of judgments are for. They're not for you. They're for the one, okay, word picture, here we go, ready? Parents get this. How many of you are parents in here? How many of you are aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, family, right? Okay. We, all, we all get this, okay? Parents, what do you do if your kid has an enemy? <laughs> Let's not answer that out loud. Okay? But it's the same thing God does. You protect and you confront their enemy. Right? See, the devil has his own plan for your life. He does, right? If the devil can obscure your identity as a child of God, he's going to do it. He's going to do whatever it takes to make sure he derails you from the purpose God is trying to pull you up into. The devil wants you to think so lowly of yourself that there's no way you think you can fulfill the purpose God has for your life. And Paul understood this. Paul, we all know Paul. He used to be called Saul. Paul, yes. right? Wrote two thirds of our New Testament Bible. He wrote this in the book of uh, one of the books of Test Thessalonians. That one. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again. But Satan prevented, prevented us. The word prevent here literally translates to cuts a ditch across the road. Why would Satan want to cut a ditch across the road? Because it changes your direction. Puts you on a different path than God intended for you to always take. So yes, the devil wants to prevent you from doing what God has in store for you, which is why his mighty acts of judgments are against him. Amen. Right? Amen. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians. I can say that. 2 Corinthians. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. 
Paul understood that God's mighty acts of judgments weren't directed towards him, but it was against the one who was preventing him from filling his purpose. Peter said it this way, in one of, his, in one of the two letters that Peter wrote. He says, in view of all of this, make efforts to respond to God's promises. So what's God's promises? That he wants to redeem you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to find freedom. He wants you to discover purpose. And he, wants, he wants you to make a difference. Those are his promises. That's the journey. That's what we're talking about, right? So in view of all this, make efforts to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Um, and moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their old sins. But let's change that word cleansed just for a second. Forgetting that they've been redeemed from their old sins. You were repurchased. You were bought back. You were restored. So let's stop being short-sighted. And let's see God picking us up and setting our feet upon the rock and redeeming us to what he originally instored us to do. Right? So... Something like, I think Jeff told me, something like 50% of Christians ask this on a daily basis or a weekly basis. What is my purpose? Right? If 87% of Christians never make it out of cup two finding freedom, that's a lot of people that don't know what their purpose is. Right? So the first step in discovering what your purpose is is you have to understand your divine design or how God made you. Here at New Day Church, um, we, we do it with a personality traits this profile, okay? But but God says this. Let's go back a little bit. Okay. God says this. In Ephesians, Paul wrote this. God, you are God's masterpiece. You he what uh, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things he's planned for us long ago. Long ago. Meaning probably before you were ever even a thought. God had a purpose and intention. He saw a need in the world for you to fulfill, specifically you. Right? So you can trust that God deliberately, deliberately made you the way that you are. There is no mistakes about the things you experience. There's no mistakes about the way that you act and the way you react. You were deliberately made the way that you are for a specific purpose. Okay? God didn't knit you together in your mother's womb and then go, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> so, but, I mean, sometimes that's how we feel, right? God didn't breathe life into you and then decide what he was going to do for you. He knew exactly what he was going to do with you from the very beginning. Right? So here we use, like I said, we use a personality disc profile which are your dominant, influential, steadiness, and compliant different personality types, right? I am a high I, influential. I've heard it described as a party waiting for a place to happen, okay? That's who I am. I like to be in the center of attention. Get out, right? Okay, but here, here's another guy that was a high I. You guys might have heard of this guy. Winston Churchill? He was so influential with words that he caused his entire country to go to war. Because that's how God designed him. He was influential, high eye personality type. Jesus, I read a book that described how Jesus was all of it. He was high D, low D, high I, low I, high S, high, low S, high C, low S. Woo! That's a party, right? But he was it all. He, he was perfect. He did it all. And he did it all perfectly. But Jesus used words to change the world. He showed up and he taught in parables to get everybody on the same playing field and then make a point 
to completely destroy the, what people thought of God. Right? God, the Father, showed his high eye when he spoke and he influenced all of creation. Right? So knowing how God designed you is very important. So today, as Justin said in the announcements, today, directly after service, Jeff will be across the way doing step two. I challenge you to go through it. If it's been a long time since you've been through it, I challenge you to go through it again. Even if that means you have to miss the vision meeting, I'd rather you learn God's purpose for your life than hear me and Justin talk about what's coming up in the future. That's how important this is to me. Okay? Challenge, stay. During that next step, step two, there's another thing you're going to do. And you're going to learn how God has spiritually gifted you. Okay? From, so when you began this journey, and you became a Christian, and when, you, when you knew God, when you came to the knowing knowledge of who God was, the Holy Spirit dwelt you. Right? And he begins, he brings a spiritual gifting that works in harmony with our, our personalities, with our experiences, with our abilities, right? That's why there's only, there's a specific purpose for you because you're the only one that has your past, your experiences, and your abilities. My past is not your past. Yes, we might share similar kind of stories, but how many of you can honestly say that you've almost died in the deserts of Iraq? <laughs> I can. That's my story. Right? So he's giving you spiritual gifts that align and are in harmony with your personalities, your experiences, and your abilities. So what is a spiritual gift? Right? It, it's simply put, it's a special supernatural ability that God gives each of his kids because you are a child of God, right? And he loves you and he wants to give you things, right? So, so that together, together, we can advance the purpose of this world, his purpose in this world, his kingdom come. His will be done. Right? Paul said this, 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it's the same spirit that is the source of them all. There's different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in us all. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Right? So, first thing I want you to look at is the word different and same are used three different times in this passage, right? Different gifts, same spirit. Different service, same Lord. Different ways, same God. So, if there's different gifts, different services, and different ways, but it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God, wouldn't you expect everybody to be able to do something differently and uniquely to them? Even though it's the same Spirit that's giving us those gifts? And then each one of those gifts are going to react differently to every different situation. Wordplay. Here it comes. Right? So we're all sitting at a big dinner table. Somebody drops their dessert. Okay? Depending on your spiritual gifts, because that's what we're looking at right now, is going to depend on how you're going to respond to this situation. I'm going to go over a few. If you have a gift of mercy, you're probably going to be like, don't feel bad. It could have happened to anyone. If you have a gift of, spirit, of serving, you'd be like, Man, let me help you clean that up. Right? If you have a gift of teaching. <laughs> hey, the reason it fell is because you had too much weight on one side of the plate and it just jumped over. <laughs> right? Man, here's my favorite one. If you have a gift of administration. There it comes, you're already. 
Hey, Jim, can you go get the mop? Sue, can you help him pick that up? Mary, can you come help me make a plate of dessert for this guy? That's you who comes see me after service. <laughs> right? Me, I would have reacted like preaching. That would have been me. I would have reacted. You know why that fell? Because you weren't paying attention. <laughs> that's why I fell. That, that's me. That's how I, I, trust me, I know. I have two kids. Do it all the time. Okay? Each of these are good. There's nothing wrong with those reactions to any of it. Because it all comes from the same spirit who lives inside of us. You're uniquely you. James said this. James, the brother of Jesus, you know that guy? You know, who didn't believe Jesus was who he was until Jesus rose from the dead. And he was like, oh, I missed it. <laughs> that guy? So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in, heaven, in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, become his prized possession. So this morning, don't be misled. Don't be misled. Because the gift God has given specifically to you is perfect. And you are designed exactly the way you are, perfectly. Paul wrote, you are God's masterpiece. God created you to fulfill a purpose that only you can't fulfill. I can't do it. Justin can't do it. Jeff can't do it. Right? So I'm going to end this. I'm going to ask Katie to come up here and do her little piano thing. I can't do it. Um, with a few facts, a poem and a song. And I'm going to sing the song. Okay, It's fun. I like the song. Okay? Katie, when I get to that point, please stop playing because you're not going to play what I sing. Okay? <laughs> you're not. I promise. I promise you're not. Okay? So here's the facts, right? In your human body, there are over 200 bones. Okay? If you break down your muscles, there's over a thousand parts to them. If you look at your capillary nervous, your nerves, over 3,000 parts to those. There are 79 organs inside of your body. And if you broke those down into different parts, 2,500 different parts in your human body. Yet, over 80% of Christians never make it to this cup and discover their purpose. What if 80% of your body didn't know what its purpose was? <laughs> Think about it. If 80% of the body of Christ doesn't know what its purpose is, we can't function the way God's designed us to function. That's why this cup, this part of the journey is so important and I'm so passionate about it. Because when I, when I figured this out, when I learned what my, my purpose was, how God designed me, it changed everything. So that I can move with, move forward in the journey with what Justin's talking about next week, making a difference. So the poem I'm going to read you is a little silly. But it's awesome, right? I found this book, this, this, this poem, and a Dr. Seuss book that I read to Connor. Okay? I changed two words in it to make it fit the message a little bit better. Instead of happy birthday, it says something different, okay? Today, you are you. That is truer than true. There's no one alive who is youer than you. Shout loud, I am lucky to be what I am. Thank goodness I'm not just a clam or a ham. I am what I am. That's a great thing to be. If I say so myself, I just love being me. 
Now these are the stories we read to our kids because we want them to understand that who they are is perfect. There's nothing wrong with them being the way that they are. Yet when we get to be adults, we forget that. That's why God has to stoop down and pull us back up. And sometimes we wish we had something that somebody else had. Why can't I have that gift? I got mercy. <laughs> right? Or, 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 or why can't I play the piano the way Katie plays the piano? Why can't I play the guitar the way Chris or John plays the guitar? Why can't I play the bass or the drums the way Sylvester uh, uh, Bay plays the drums? That's not your purpose. They're amazing. They're gifted. They, they're fulfilling God's purpose. And they're looking for people. Specifically a sound guy. If you like your music a specific way, come talk to me. I'll learn you how to make it your way right here in service, okay? But you are you. And that's truer than true. God's designed you specifically to do something. So don't be jealous of what somebody else got because they don't have what you got. And here's the song. And uh, this was first sang by a Disney character. Again, kids, right? We want them to know how true being themselves is. And it goes like this. I practice this a lot. Okay? <laughs> the most wonderful thing about tears, our tears are a wonderful thing. They're tops are made out of rubber. The bottoms are made out of spring. They're bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, bouncy, fun, 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 fun. The most wonderful thing about tears, I'm the only one. <laughs> This morning, yeah, I had some fun. I love doing this. Okay. I want you to understand that you are you. Don't try to be me. Don't try to be the person next to you. Don't even try to be your husband or your wife. You are you. God has a specific purpose and design for you. Figure out what it is. Get tied in so that you can make a difference. Amen. Right? Amen. So this morning, I'm going to ask everybody to, to go ahead and bow their head and close their eyes. This morning, if you're here and you've never started this journey, you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Romans says this, for it is believing in your heart that you, you, Jesus, you, God, have made me right with God. And it's by opening and clearing your faith that you are saved. This morning, if that's you, I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm not asking you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to simply ask you to raise your hands. If you've never taken that step of faith, If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. One, don't be scared. Don't be nervous. Don't, be, don't back down. Two, be courageous. Be brave. Three. I'm going to ask us all to uh, say this prayer with me, just in case. Father, thank you. That you sent your son to die for me. And that I can be redeemed to you. I ask that you forgive me my sins. And help me discover my purpose. 